Today we want to talk about uh, stresses. And so I want to begin with sort of the, the most basic uh, definitions that you probably learned maybe as freshmen uh, when, you, when you began your, your engineering career. So in, in one dimension, um, you know, we usually think of stress uh, as sort of a pulling on a bar in unidirection. So we pull on it with some force, F, it has some cross-sectional area A, and then we would define stress as sigma equals F over A, right? Some force per unit area, okay? And then hopefully as you move through your, your undergraduate career, you took on a little bit more of an advanced uh, view of, of stress, and you realize that stress is in fact a tensor, and you probably uh, maybe could write it something like stress as a tensor, and you wrote it in its matrix components, sigma 1, 1, sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, sigma 2, 2, sigma 2, 3, sigma 3, 3. And then you probably, uh, just because your professor told you, uh, knew that it was symmetric, although you didn't probably prove that, um, we're not going to prove it either. Uh, you do that in continuum mechanics when you do a, a conservation of angular momentum is what is what you need to show that the stress tensor is symmetric. Uh, and that's sigma 2, 3. So there you end up with a stress tensor that looks something like this. And hopefully you're able to identify what each of these stresses means in sort of a real physical space. So if I were to draw uh, some sort of set of coordinate axes here, um, something like this, and let's go ahead and label these 1, 2, and 3. And then I draw my conventional stress cube here. Uh, something like this. There, there. Okay. So that's supposed to be a cube. I realize it's not perfect. And then you should hopefully remember that if I have a stress on the one plane in the one direction, that's sigma 1, 1. If I have a stress on the one plane in the two direction, that's a shear, and we would call that sigma one plane in the two direction, sigma one, two. And then similarly, you could have a stress in the, on the one plane in the three direction that you would call sigma one, three. Okay, and you could do this so on and so forth. Uh, you have an opposite if you're on the two face here, moving in the one direction, uh, that would be sigma 2 1 which we know is equal to sigma 1 2 okay and then I'm not going to draw the whole cube for you but it, it just goes on like this so on and so forth so you have six unique uh, stresses okay so that's I would say uh, a typical place for most of uh, undergrad knowledge about stress to end uh, we want to introduce uh, one more uh, entity that's sort of important as we as we try to uh, treat uh, our mechanics a little bit more formally. <clears throat> and we want to talk about what's called a traction vector. And we usually just write that as T. Okay. So what is a traction vector? Well, it's a force uh, vector. Uh, and it's going to be, just as before, per unit area so it's going to have units of stress. Um, it's going to occur at a point in the body, in some, some continuum body. right? And stress, as we know, is a field quantity, which means it varies from point to point within any, in any body, or could vary as from point to point. So when we talk about this stress tensor, we're not actually talking about this, the average, we're talking about something that exists at a point. And if it happens to be everything's uniform, then, then every point has the same stress. But that's not a requirement for the stress tensor. So it's at a point. And then it, this is really important. It's, uh, it occurs on the surface of a cut plane. Whoops. that's defined by the unit normal n. What that means is 
If I have, here's my continuum potato again. And then the dash line to show that it's behind. If I were to take at some, some point P in that um, continuum body, so there's our boundary here. And I want to actually look at look at something with respect to point P. So at P, let's take let's choose a plane in at that point, a cut plane, and we're going to want to look at there's our right angle. That plane is defined by the unit normal n. And the traction vector is if I were to make that cut is basically the what what we would call a stress vector, a traction vector t that exists on that plane. Okay? We could formally define it as or mathematically we would say that t and sometimes we'll superscript it by just reminding you it's in the direction n is equal to the limit as dA goes to 0 of the differential vector df, which is on that plane, so in the n direction, divided by dA. Okay. So that's that's what a traction vector is. Now you're you're probably going well. Um, I'm not sure how that what that matters uh, with respect to anything we're learning here. You already kind of know what a traction vector is, so let's give a really quick example. So if I were to say at, at point P, so at P, let me choose a plane that looks like this. It's defined as N is equal to 1, 0, 0. So this is the, a plane that's defined in the X direction. Okay. And you have a stress tensor representation, let's say in this case sigma 1 1 and then zeros everywhere else okay you don't need any formula to conclude that the traction vector in the direction n is just given by sigma 1 1 uh, that's the component of the 1 1 or the stress tensor in the one direction on the one plane and that's the plane we selected uh, and then if you wanted to write this, you could write that in, it's in the one direction. Okay? But here's the question that I'll pose to you. So, what about an arbitrary n? Right, one that's not necessarily aligned with the unit direction, or... Um, how are we going to how are we going to compute the traction vector on that now one of the things that's important to note here is that hopefully you can see that there's some link between the stress tensor and this traction vector and if you've taken a little bit more advanced mechanics or or maybe even mathematics you know that one of the features of a tensor or at least a second order tensor is that it operates on a vector typically to return a vector and I would expect that most of your experience with the stress tensor, you haven't used it to operate on any sort of a vector. But you can maybe surmise that we're going to use the stress tensor to operate on some vector uh, to give us back maybe a traction vector in this case. Looks like I forgot my parenthesis up here. So how are we going to do that? So what do we need to think about for an arbitrary n? So let's go ahead and consider the following schema, uh, schematic. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll draw our, the same axes here. Okay, this will be the one, the two, and the three axes. And what we typically do is something like this. We draw what's called a Cauchy tetrahedron. Okay, and we'll, the, this plane that comes out, that's actually N, and we're interested in what is the, 
what is the traction vector on that plane? So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, draw some arbitrary vector. I don't know what the traction vector is going to be, but we're going to try to solve for that. And I'm going to put it as the superscript and to tell you it's in that direction. So that's the question that we're trying to answer. So in order to continue to solve this, we need to actually write the tractions on all the faces. So we're trying to solve for the traction uh, in the n direction, or sorry, let me back up. We're trying to solve for the traction that exists on the surface defined by the unit normal n. And so we also know that, let's take this bottom plane here. That plane is defined in the two direction. So if I were to write this, I could write, that would be e, uh, it's actually a negative in the E2, and there's some traction vector coming off of that. We'll call that T, some, whatever the traction vector is, in the E2 direction. Okay, and off this plane, this is the negative one direction, we could have some arbitrary traction vector coming off there. We would call that traction vector in the E1 direction. Okay, and then similarly, um, uh, similarly, we would have a traction vector. It's kind of hard to show off here, so I'm just going to be a little cautious uh, and say there's some traction coming off that back plane. That would be in the in the three directions. That would be T in E3. So now, in order to solve for uh, T on the N plane, we just use statics. So we use statics now to solve. Remember, all statics says is that the sum of the forces is equal to zero. Okay, so how do we go about writing that? Well, we have a force on the, the N plane, a force on the E1 plane, a force on the E2 plane, and a force on the E3 plane. We just add those up. Uh, they're chosen such that the E1, E2, and E3 plane forces are all in the negative directions of their respective axes and the... the uh, forces on the end plane are all in the positive directions so that we can write um, T the traction on the end plane times DS which is just the, the surface area of that plane minus the traction vector on the E1 plane times the area of that uh, one plane the same thing for 2, so there's E2, and then that's DS2 minus another in the 3 direction, DS3, and that's going to equal 0. So what we need to talk about now is how I need to somehow relate DS1 to DS, if I'm going to actually make any headway here. So let's just consider... the term ds1. Okay, so if we think about that, that looks like ds1, we wanna know how it's related to ds. If you look here, uh, and this just goes back to basic um, trigonometry, we, we can project this area in the one direction just by multiplying that times the cosine of n and E1. Okay, so if you look at this, this is actually a unit vector, and this quantity is a unit vector, and so this is really just the projection. What's the projection of N in the E1 direction? Well, that is just N1, the first component of N, so this just looks like DS times N1. And then we can say similarly, For ds2 and ds3, we have ds2 will be equal to ds times n2, and then ds3 will be ds times n3. 
So then I can go ahead and I can substitute DS1, DS2, and DS3 into the, the above equation. And I end up with T in the N direction. And I'm going to move the other move those other three terms to the other side. So I have TDS is equal to T in the E1 direction times N1 DS plus T in the E2 direction times N2 DS plus T in the E3 direction times N3 DS. Obviously, I can divide by DS and get rid of that entirely and just end up with the quantity T. And I'm going to go ahead and flip to index notation and write this as TI is going to be equal to TI E1 times N1 plus Ti uh, on the 2 plane times N2 plus Ti on the 3 plane N3. Okay, and I can use the Einstein summation convention that we talked about in our very first lecture uh, on, on um, uh, notation to write this as Ti e in the Ej direction times nj. Okay, let's go ahead and call this, so let me bring this down here. We'll call this equation star. We're almost there. Now let's think about this term here, this ti ej. What, what is the, let's pick i is equal to 1, so t1. So what is the stress in the one direction on the one plane? That would be 1, 1. Well, that's sigma 1, 1. And if I choose the two direction in the one plane, that'd be sigma, uh, sorry, the yeah, the two direction on the one plane would be um, sigma 1, 2. So what we find is that this quantity here actually is sigma ij. Okay, so we're just, we can now just define that quantity. So we define okay, the Cauchy stress tensor sigma ij, or sigma ji, let's call it, so let's be consistent, as follows. Sigma ji is equal to ti ej. Okay. Okay. And now we can write what's called the Cauchy stress formula. Okay. So the which is the topic of this lecture. The Cauchy stress formula. It says that Ti in the n direction is equal to sigma ji nj, and by symmetry of the stress tensor is equivalent to writing sigma ij times nj. Okay? So what that means and is that if you know the stress tensor, you multiply the stress tensor by any unit normal vector, it will give you the traction vector on that uh, plane that's defined by n. So that's a pretty powerful tool. We're going to use it going forward. Um, and um, it's sort of a, a critical cog in our in our wheel of uh, that we need to develop the governing equations of, of uh, linear elastic mechanics.